Well, thank you for having me here. Welcome, everybody. Today I'm going to be speaking about a very interesting area or branch of science called epigenetics. Epigenetics has actually been around for quite some time. It simply uh, was overshadowed by its more popular uh, sister, which is genetics. The discovery of the DNA uh, and all the excitement with the Human Genome Project kind of overshadowed the critical and crucial area of science of, of epigenetics. As a matter of fact, Conrad Waddington is the British embryologist who used that term in the late 30s, early 40s. And he used it to, to describe the heritable changes to a gene's expression uh, by means of mechanisms other than changing the underlying DNA sequence. So we'll go ahead and talk about that, but I'd like to start with the actual Human Genome Project. A little background, in 1990 uh, is when the quest began to sequence the DNA, the human DNA, and, and try to figure out what does the blueprint entail for us. A working draft of this genome was released in 2000, a completed one in April of 2003. What this showed us was that as human beings, we have approximately 25,000 genes. Every single one of us has approximately 25,000 genes. Now, this was a very huge development. As a matter of fact, uh, President Bill Clinton at the time said that with the completion of the Human Genome Project, we will uh, essentially be able to overcome all the diseases which we fear, aging, uh, any mechanisms associated with cancer, neurological disorders, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all of these issues would seemingly vanish as long as we are able to complete this critical uh, task, which was partially right, not to take anything away from the hum Human Genome Project. It was rather beneficial to us. However, it did not answer everything. This is an excellent quote I picked up from a physician at MD Anderson who specializes in epigenetics. He said, yet as researchers waded deeper into the study of human genes, the genetic coding of a malignant cell often turned out to be, by all appearances, normal. By all appearances, normal. So what would make a cell with no noted mutations go so horribly awry as in the case with cancer, right? So what would make a cell with no mutations go so horribly awry? What controls this blueprint? Right? So we all establish that as human beings we have a blueprint and it consists of 25,000 genes. But what controls this? The human body has on average 10 trillion cells. It's estimated to be as high as 50 trillion cells. Okay? With that we have approximately 200 different types of cells. 200 different types of cells. Yet all 10 trillion of these cells producing these 200 variations read one single solitary script, right? They're all going off of the same script. So how can 200 different cells be formed, right, with, with an uh, outstanding 10 trillion cells reading the exact same script? So it begs the question, what or how does a cell become a heart cell, a skin cell, a liver cell with that exact same DNA? The answer is the epigenome. The answer is the epigenome. I want you to picture a DVD. There's a lot of information inside a DVD, right? Well, how useful would that DVD be with the movie or the data or whatever you put on it without a DVD player? Not very useful. So as essential as our genes are, without the epigenome, they're worthless. The epigenome quite literally means above the genome. Epi is Latin for on top of or above. And in, it's not very visible, but if you can see here, the outside skirts of that DNA molecule that we know so well is where the epigenome exists. Okay, so literally the phrase means on top of the gene, epigenome. Epigenome can change according to an individual's environment, environment defined by your physical environment and your emotional environment. Physically, where do you live, right? Where do you live? What are you breathing in on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you live on a nice crisp mountain, uh, breathing in fresh air all day? Or are you more uh, intertwined in a uh, rather city setting with lots of traffic and fumes? As a matter of fact, I uh, gave a lecture in uh, A4M Thailand, and I noticed something. It was my first time in Bangkok, and I noticed that there was a lot. <laughs> I thought Houston had a lot of traffic, but in Bangkok, oh, my God, there was more traffic than I've ever seen at midnight uh, in my life. And these traffic controllers were wearing these masks 
with very good reason because quite literally what they're breathing in on a constant basis is wreaking complete havoc, epigenetically that is, to, to their genes. So physical environment is essential, right? Emotional environment can cause an epigenetic change as well, and I'm going to lead into a study for that a little later as we go. But your emotional environment, the old saying that uh, toxic people are toxic for you, all of that kind of factors in. And with, uh, with the excitement and the development of epigenetics, a lot of neuroscientists and psychological uh, associated personnel are finding this to be very, very beneficial to speak about because it kind of validates what they've been saying this whole time. And of course, lifestyle choices. Lifestyle choices, what you eat, what you drink, what you smoke, what you, uh, uh, did you exercise, did you not exercise, how much do you exercise, your sleep pattern, everything about you outside of those other two parameters will affect the epigenome. So your epigenome can change according to an individual's environment and lifestyle. Epigenetic changes do not alter genes, but instead affect the expression of the genes. I'm going to repeat that. Epigenetic changes do not alter your genes, only hits the expression of the genes. So in other words, if this room was a cell and we have 10 trillion of them in our body, the lights above our head, let's count out 25,000 of them, represent our genes. 